This is the second video in the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 4 on calcaneal fractures uh, by Drs. Weatherford and Munns. Um, I am Saka Berman. I'm going to be narrating these slides. And in the first video, we went through the anatomy, uh, the pathoanatomy, classification, uh, evaluation of the patient, and um, Hopefully you've uh, understood that. Again, the calcaneus has uh, a bit of an unusual anatomy, and it's very important to, uh, uh, if you're going to treat these, to, to really understand the relationships and uh, how the fractures occur, the primary and secondary fracture lines, etc. And uh, as I had hinted, uh, these, or as I had said, the, the, these injuries can uh, be somewhat devastating. Uh, their treatment is somewhat controversial. Um, and uh, let's get into the goals of treatment now and some of the emergency indications in this second video. So the goals of treatment really are to maintain and support uh, the lateral column of the foot, um, to uh, be dynamically stable but accommodative, uh, uh, have an accommodative foundation for body weight, and provide a lever arm for propulsive gait through the gastroxyleus complex. So by restoration of function, we want to restore subtalar motion, ankle motion, and have a painless gait. Uh, with anatomy restoration, we want to restore the articular surface, uh, restore um, overall calcaneal morphology with regard to height, length, and width, as we talked about in the last video. Uh, we want to uh, narrow that heel in order for them to be able to get into regular shoes. Um, provide appropriate height for ankle function and appropriate length for foot alignment. So there are some conditions that are emergent uh, when treating calcaneal fractures. You've got to be really careful uh, when you get a call about a calcaneous fracture or you go to see somebody or decide not to see somebody uh, because maybe it just sounds like a foot fracture and not that emergent. Well. The thin soft tissue envelope around the ankle and the foot um, can lead to fractures that can cause skin tenting and essentially threaten the skin uh, and uh, put the skin at risk for necrosis. So a displaced tongue fragment or an avulsion fracture. So this is a tongue fragment, meaning it's an intraarticular calcaneal fracture that has, um, as you can see, has displaced significantly. You can also get um, a uh, tuberosity avulsion that doesn't necessarily come intraarticular, maybe a fracture or something like this. Um, and uh, this, by definition, doesn't cause uh, threatened skin, but if you ever see this, you have to check and make sure the skin posteriorly is not blanched or tented and um, at risk for causing skin death. So uh, these have to be often reduced uh, and fixed emergently uh, to take that pressure off the skin posteriorly. Okay, even if you have to reduce it and pin it and keep the foot in plantar flexion. But oftentimes screw fixation can be done early as well, percutaneously. Um, and here you can see a case where perhaps that has been uh, developing. Uh, the, again, that, that would be uh, in the posterior part of the uh, heel here. There's another circle. Okay, so unfortunately, what you don't want to have happen is to let it get to this point uh, where you're now already getting skin necrosis and epidermal slough and perhaps some full thickness skin loss in that central area. So, uh, you know, these can be fixed if you're not comfortable, uh, be reduced and pinned, uh, but uh, it's not extraordinarily difficult to, to fix these emergently. Um, uh, with screw fixation and get satisfactory uh, reduction and uh, and then prevent the skin from, from dying at the same time. Now you can also have a calcaneal fracture dislocation. This is a much less common injury, um, but um, you may need to reduce this emergently. So this is when you have lateral dislocation of the subtalar joint, uh, a transcalcaneal talonovic dislocation, um, and what you need to do is you need to get the posterior facet back under the talus. Um, and uh, oftentimes this may require some external fixation or temporary pins uh, in order to maintain at least a reasonable reduction. Okay, and here you can see that, uh, that fragment dislocated. Okay, and unfortunately 
um, if left alone, I mean, you can have pretty devastating consequences. So here's an example of an external fixator essentially across the ankle and hind foot. So you can see here, uh, you don't really need to go too high on the tibia. Um, in this particular case, uh, you can see a pin actually going across the uh, midfoot and uh, a pin in the uh, tuberosity in order to uh, get a provisional reduction. Okay. So you can see what you really want to do is get height, restore length, and uh, restore um, the um, uh, sort of displacement of the tuberosity laterally. Okay, and here you can see a uh, reduction. And um, there's different systems you can use. Typically in the, in the midfoot and forefoot, you might need to have something that has smaller pins, although in the calcaneus and in the tibia, you can often use like five millimeter pins. Now, open fractures are another emergent condition. Um, they uh, usually occur on the medial side, and oftentimes you'll have sort of a transverse type laceration medially. Uh, it's a tension failure of the skin, the sustentacular fragment comes through. So these are the cases where oftentimes when you go to debride them and eventually fix them, you'll be on that medial side rather than the lateral side where you can oftentimes provide direct buttress fixation uh, if you choose to do that. Um, of course, these are going to have uh, increased uh, complications uh, due to soft tissue healing, um, so you have to be very careful. Um, in, an, in an injury, you already have to be very careful with. Um, so you want to treat these with emergent debridement, tension-free tension -free closure, possibly over a small drain, and provisional fixation to prevent that tenting from occurring again, or the fragment from wanting to come through. And here you can see with K-wires and uh, buried uh, pins um, how uh, fracture was uh, you know, managed um, in a staged manner. So um, if the wound is clean and can be closed, you could, defend, you could consider definitive fixation through that medial wound. So as I said here, uh, if this is the fragment that comes through the open wound, here you can you can sometimes provide direct buttress fixation, um, uh, you know, up against this medial part of the calcaneus and go through the medial wound. Um, and here you can see an example of that and where there's direct buttress fixation um, of the primary fracture line uh, and then um, additional fixation uh, from posterior to anterior. Okay, so that's sort of a... Harris uh, axial view and now a lateral view demonstrating that. Compartment syndrome, as I mentioned in the first video, um, this is something that gets missed a lot. Um, so uh, you really have to be careful to, to look for this, but it's an emergent condition like compartment syndrome anywhere. Um, you can have a tense foot. You should have marked pain or pain out of proportion. You have to be very careful in the obtunded patient who's not able to give you a good history and uh, as anywhere else, you may have to consider compartment pressure measurements. Uh, the treatment is controversial. Most authors recommend uh, fasciotomies. So alternative fractures. Um, most of what we've been talking about are um, the uh, intraarticular fractures, joint depression, and tongue type, but you can also have um, an anterior process fracture, a tuberosity body fracture, tuberosity avulsion, sustentaculum fracture. So through an inversion mechanism, uh, you can have a small uh, anterior process fracture as shown here. These can sometimes go into a non-union. You can excise them if they're symptomatic. Uh, and if they're large and displaced, uh, they can be treated with ORF. So, Tuberosity avulsion, as I mentioned before, are one of those fractures that can sometimes uh, cause skin tenting posteriorly. So you've got to be careful with them and make sure that there's uh, not an indication to fix them acutely. Uh, it's, in some ways, you look at it, it looks a little bit like the tongue type, but you don't have that primary fracture line. You don't have the intraarticular fracture. You literally just have this avulsion. It's kind of like an Achilles tendon rupture, uh, but with a large avulsion. So it really is a different injury altogether. Uh, these can be uh, treated with lag screws or tension band. Uh, very small fragments can be treated with um, uh, 
uh, just Achilles uh, repair uh, or advancement with uh, FHL transfer if needed and gas rock recession take tension off again you have to be uh, you have to be cautious to make sure you don't have any skin problems posteriorly okay here you can see an example where it's had to be resected um, sustentaculum fractures are uh, another fracture uh, uncommon um, but this can destabilize the subtalar joint usually they're small and non-displaced but if you have a large fragment you may need to directly fix them from the medial side um, and uh, kind of like you saw with that open fracture uh, example um, this this can uh, this can you know potentially benefit from a direct approach if needed so also, as you talked about in the first video, history is really important. You want to understand the patient factors, uh, the injury factors, and also you want to take into account the surgeon factors. And all this helps you to decide how to best treat a particular patient. Um, these are challenging injuries to treat operatively. They have a high risk of complication. Um, so, to one, do, you know, on one hand, um, uh, you know, a lot of risk involved. Uh, and if it's not something the surgeon's uh, particularly expert at, uh, non-operative management might be better for that patient if they can't get into somebody else's hands uh, for operative management. So age of the patient to some degree uh, is a, something you've got to take into account. Geriatric patients have traditionally had poor results. There's really no good age cutoff. Um, you know, there has been... Um, uh, some literature to support uh, you know, higher risk of complications with uh, older patients. Um, so you have to be a little bit more careful when considering operative uh, management in this age group. Um, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, neuropathy, these all cause increased risk of complications. And really, if you have these patients, um, you may run a second, you know, guess yourself if you are thinking about operative management. Of course, emergent conditions are different, but you know, intra-articular uh, intra fracture without any skin uh, threatening may not be the best case uh, for ORIF in one of these patients. The risk of complications is high. Other patient factors, uh, mental incapacity for various reasons. If they can't cooperate with protected weight bearing and rehab protocols, might have uh, more problems if you operate on them and then they proceed to walk on it immediately. So you want to consider non-operative management and um, avoid some of those complications. Smoking. So um, there has been report uh, reports of uh, higher complication rates in smokers. So um, if you can't get the patient to quit smoking, you really may have to consider non-operative management in, in these patients or percutaneous and minimally invasive approaches that don't have a large um, lateral extensile flap. So to some degree, the severity of displacement correlates with outcome, right? So a low or negative bowler's angle correlates with a poor outcome regardless of operative, non-operative management. So that typically leads to you know, a wider heel, possibly more varus, um, you know, more shortening, so that's why you know the bowler's angle is is very helpful, and just that lateral X-ray is very helpful uh, to be able to um, you know, tell a patient how they're going to do. Soft tissue injury can determine outcome more than fracture pattern. Uh, if you have those horrible blisters that don't uh, heal up, like you saw, big hemorrhagic blisters, it can be a problem. Open calcaneal fractures are going to have a much higher risk of infection. Um, and there's surgeon factors. Like, as I said, this is not an easy fracture to treat. You can see the anatomy is very complicated. Uh, they're challenging to treat operatively because you want to wait on them, but the longer you wait, the harder it can be to get those fractures, especially the primary fracture line, reduced. And in fact, the complications can end up being worse than non-operative management. So, um, you know, you have to really take that into account and uh, not to overextend um, what you're able to handle as a surgeon. So, as I said, operative versus non-operative management is indeed a, con a controversy here. Uh, do you just, do you treat these non-operatively all, all, all together, uh, in which case you're not going to get a reduction, uh, or do you take the risk and operate on them? Well, um, 
you know, in, in this particular um, older series, operative treatment was successful and preferable unless there were contraindications. Uh, however, um, this is a study you, you're going to see quoted more often. This is from the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society, uh, Rick Buckley et al. And this was a prospective multicenter randomized study. So, um, study design that's uh, been lauded, it, it has a reasonable number of patients, uh, and it really looked at this question. And in this study, they really didn't find a significant difference of operative versus non-operative management. Uh, but you'd have to look at this a little bit more carefully to, to understand which patients actually maybe did better with operative management versus non-op. Um, so let's get into that. Well, um, there was a significant difference in favor of surgery if you took workers' comp patients out, uh, meaning they don't do well if you operate on them. Um, and then there was a greater satisfaction rate with surgery. Uh, and um, less expensive treatment is ORAF for calcaneus fractures when you think about all the time off work and additional uh, subtalar fusion surgeries needed down the road. So there's a lot of ways to look at this. But still, I think, you know, it is a controversial issue. Um, Other uh, subgroup analysis uh, results showed that uh, women did better with surgery. Bowler's angle 0 to 14 did better with surgery. Younger patients, as I mentioned, patients who were not workers comp, people with lighter work activities, comminuted fractures, and a large initial joint step off did better with surgery. So. It's controversial. There are some subgroups you can identify would probably do better with surgery, but you know there's a lot of uh, factors you got to take into account, right? Um, so non-operative management in general is good for non or minimally displaced fractures. Patients with significant risk factors like diabetic, peripheral vasculopath, etc., heavy smoker maybe, um, and you're going to treat them non-weight bearing. But you want to get the ankle and, and hind foot and midfoot moving early, right? So you don't want to put them in a cast for 12 weeks. You want to keep them non-weight bearing. But as the soft tissues are getting better, you really want to start moving them soon, okay? Because otherwise they get really stiff. And you really want to help prevent an equinus contracture as well. So unfortunately, um, Many patients, you know, and this is very old data here, can have long-term symptoms, uh, difficulty with their subtalar joints, so uneven ground uh, you know, is a problem for them, can't fit in shoes with that widened heel. Uh, and like I like mentioned earlier, some of these will end up having to have some type of fusion procedure down the road. So malunions, uh, you can try custom shoes, you can try a lateral wall exostectomy, perineal tenolysis, or for instance, subtalar fusion. And if you have substantial loss of height, you may need to add in a bone block uh, fusion, meaning that you distract, uh, let's just say that there's so much shortening of the calcaneus that you have to like uh, basically put a bone block um, here to, to increase your height before doing your fusion. Okay, uh, and it's you know it's a type of procedure that's going to have more complications uh, because you've had uh, you know the anatomy is so off uh, when it's been allowed to heal non-operatively. So I'm going to pause there, and um, in the final set of slides, we're really going to get into the operative management, surgical approaches, and um, and then wrap up um, this uh, lecture on uh, calcaneal fractures. Thank you.